My name is Chuck Will. When I came to Proctor 30 years ago, I was a history teacher. And over the years, I've retained an interest specifically in the school's history, which I'd like to share with you now. The school that was to become Proctor Academy was born in the front living room of the home of Samuel Butterfield in the spring of 1848. It was here in the front parlor that Mrs. Eliza Butterfield was holding forth in a sewing circle, a gathering of women whose business was as much gossip and social discourse as needlework. Eliza put forth her strong opinion that it was time that the town of Andover provide a school for its children. So convincing was she in her argument, and so agitated did the ladies become on this point, that Mr. Samuel Butterfield, who was a member of the governor's council and the town's attorney, went about the business of drawing up incorporation papers. And on June 23, Governor Jared Williams declared the incorporation of Andover Academy. The second story of the old Union Church, located near the center of the town green, was deeded to the corporation. The balcony was floored over for additional space, and the school opened in September with 108 students enrolled. Within four years, the population swelled to 252 pupils, including students from distant towns and states who boarded with local families. But this was the largest student body the school would enjoy for 100 years. For the history of this school is not one of extended prosperity, but of economic hardships, struggle, and perseverance. In its seventh year, a smallpox epidemic closed Andover Academy. And in the decades that followed, the school repeatedly opened with new names and with meager financial support from various Christian organizations. In 1857, it opened as New England Christian Literary and Biblical Institute. In 1860, struggling for enrollments and in debt, it became Andover Christian Institute. In 1865, this too failed, at the same time that a school known as Wolfboro and Tufton Borough Academy failed in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. The trustees sadly moved the school to Wolfboro, where it operated as the Wolfboro Christian Institute for nine years. This brings us to John Proctor, the son of the village blacksmith. Proctor left his hometown of Andover at the age of 18 to seek his fortune. In 1822, he started as a second-hand sledgeman at an iron forge in Providence, Rhode Island. But by the time he returned to Andover 35 years later, he had learned to mass produce the threaded wood screw. He owned the controlling interest of the American Screw Company, and he had a fortune in the bank. He went about the business of rebuilding his hometown. Proctor brought the school back to Andover and pledged money towards improvements to classrooms and construction of a dormitory on the site of Gannett House. The trustees voted to name the school in honor of its most liberal benefactor. Within one square mile, he oversaw the construction or renovation of 26 residences, many of which belong to the school today, including Carr House, which was his home, and the Heads residence, which was the home of his brother William. He funded the construction of a municipal block now known as Proctor Block. He dammed two streams to power a gristmill and a sawmill, and he established the Proctor Cemetery, where his grave is positioned front and center. But John's greatest project was not Proctor Academy. It was the Proctor House Hotel. Located on the site of Maxwell Savage Hall, this grand 125-room resort put Andover on the map as one of the elite tourist attractions in New Hampshire. Over seven highly successful years of operation, the Proctor House Hotel hosted thousands of guests, many of them from Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, who took the new Northern Railroad to Andover Station, located where the softball diamond is today, and rode up Lawrence Street in coaches drawn by teams of horses. Unfortunately, Mr. Proctor did not believe in fire insurance, and when the hotel burned to the ground in 1881, he lost $750,000. There was little money left for the school that bore his name when he died two years later. With a new name and a new affiliation, now with the Unitarian Church, Proctor Academy opened on September 27, 1880, with three students enrolled a number that grew to 43 for the second semester. 
One of the original three was the remarkable Luella Scales, who went on to teach at Proctor for 25 years and was the first woman to serve as principal or head of school. While on the topic of great women in Proctor's history, Clara May Currier, known to her adoring students as Marm Currier, arrived at the train station as a young widow in 1902 with two little daughters in tow and went on to teach English, Latin, and Greek for 27 years. An outspoken defender of women's rights, she traveled New England addressing educational societies in support of universal suffrage. A moment ago, I mentioned the school's new affiliation with the Unitarian Universalist Church. This is important stuff. While most Western religions assume that human beings are inherently sinful and our purpose on earth is to gain salvation, Unitarians will have nothing to do with that. This is a church that believes that people are inherently good. In fact, the human mind is the triumph of evolution. This imbued to Proctor Academy a very unique and special positivism that endures today, despite the fact the Unitarian affiliation was canceled in 1958. It's the belief that students are inherently good and that they're capable of doing great things. On January 13, 1901, the old Union Church burned to the ground, taking with it the bell that had been forged by Paul Revere himself. Funds were raised to construct what became known as the Second Academy Building on the foundation of the Proctor House Hotel. This was a wooden prototype of the building we now know as Maxwell Savage Hall. And incidentally, if you look to the northeast of Maxwell Savage today, you see a restraining wall that is the original foundation of the Proctor House Hotel. Fire continued to be a nemesis to Proctor. In 1932, on the day that winter exams were held, the Second Academy Building succumbed to flames. Then, at the start of the Depression, the depth of which no one could guess, the trustees authorized the expenditure of $45,000 to build Maxwell's Savage Hall. Very soon, it became clear that too much money had been spent. As the Great Depression deepened in the 1930s, the trustees gathered an ad hoc committee of New England educators and businessmen to assess the school's assets, liabilities, and its viability. Late in August, Headmaster Carl Wetherill received a phone call conveying the bad news. Proctor was to be shut down. The job of communicating the news was botched. Students arrived for the start of the school were stunned, as were the faculty, when the headmaster announced at the opening chapel meeting that he was quitting immediately. No explanation was given, but the parents of 74 boys knew what was up. In the days that followed, dozens of automobiles, Fords and Studebakers, Chevrolets and Ramblers, pulled up to Gannett, Mary Lowell Stone, and Ives House to withdraw boys who were to be enrolled at other prep schools or their local high schools. More than half the student body bailed. Proctor Academy was going down. Or so it seemed. For a highly talented new young faculty, the notion of unemployment at the crest of the Depression was untenable. To survive, they had to make Proctor survive. Two men stood up and assumed leadership. The first was Lyle Harlan Farrell, just 22 years old, out of UNH, where he was a nine-letter man and captain of the football team. At his right hand was the remarkable Roland Burbank, just out of Dartmouth. Both newlyweds, they had no option but to make the impossible happen. Roe Burbank met the trustees in Boston and bargained for three months to balance the budget and find a new headmaster, and he won his case. The man they found to lead the school through its new crisis was John Halsey Gulick. Halsey Gulick's upbringing suited him well for a career in education. His father, Luther Gulick, was a prominent progressive era educator and theorist and was the founder of the American summer camp movement. Halsey's mother, Charlotte, was the founder of Campfire Girls of America. Halsey walked into a situation that was beyond desperate. Roland Burbank once wrote, accepting this job was either the act of a very brave or a very foolish man. The person who cut the budget is another example of an extraordinary woman in the school's history. On Thanksgiving Day, 1924, Headmaster Lloyd 
answered a knock on the door and found there a young woman with a suitcase in her hand who said, my name is Mildred and I can type. Mildred Howard went on to serve Proctor for 50 years as the assistant to five headmasters. She was the business manager when that position was called Bursar, and she told teachers who had signed contracts for $1,000 that they could be paid $600 if things worked out. When Mildred Howard retired in 1973, the school hired three people to replace her. As a leader, Halsey was a pragmatist, willing to try things that might solve one, maybe two problems at the same time. More often than not, the ideas came from Roe Burbank. If we could not afford a staff to maintain facilities, let's put the boys to work. And so was born the Improvement Squad. If a ski area was to be built, it was up to the students to do the job. Several slopes on campus had been utilized for ski instruction. They are between Gannett and what is now maintenance, the hill down to the dam east of Mack House. There even was a rope tow up to Silo Hill, which is now occupied by Farrell Fieldhouse. But the first real ski area before the Blackwater was above what is now Leonard Field, the football field. Here with axes, boys cleared Slalom Hill and under Roe Burbank's guidance, installed a rope tow powered by a Ford engine at the bottom. It is easy today to see the wheels embedded in trees on the left as you walk up, wheels that guided the rope back down the hill. When tennis courts were to be built east of Carey House, it was the boys who graded the surface and poured the concrete. When those courts needed to be swept after snow melt, it was up to the students to do the job. Coal needed to be delivered from the train station to central heating plant. Lawns needed to be cut. In 1942, this ethic of hands to work reached its zenith as a summer semester was offered to boys looking for credits towards graduation as they were drafted into service in World War II. For years, the Fenton family, who lived in what is now known as Farmhouse, had sold produce to the kitchen in Carey House. Now, responding to the war, the Fentons and Proctor Academy went to work on a prodigious victory garden that would supply the school with lettuce and corn in the fall, squash and potatoes throughout the winter. A root cellar below Mary Lowell Stone did the job. Always the innovative creator of new programs, Roe Burbank started the Cabin Club in 1943. This was one of Roe's great passions and successes. His teams of students finished a wood-heated log cabin in 1945 and enjoyed several outdoor lunches to celebrate. A new cabin was constructed on the same site in 1993. Under Halsey Gulick, the school offered two academic tracks. One was clearly college preparatory. The other was called the liberal or general course, which offered concentrations in mechanical arts like wood shop, boat building, machine shop, and metal shop. With hindsight, it is easy to see the birth of many courses that we now call skills courses in the 1940s. For many years, a World War II Hellcat sat east of Maxwell Savage. This was at a time when Halsey Gulick led a Civil Air Patrol flying club out of Concord. At the same time, the Proctor Academy Fire Department became a significant part of school life for many students. An antique auto club was active throughout the 1940s and early 50s. It is important to note the importance of the railroad to the school throughout its history until the 1970s. Students came to Proctor by train, their girlfriends visited by train. Now a retrospective on sports. No particular sequence here, just some of the better images. It should be noted that in the 1950s, Proctor became known as the school on skis at a time when hockey and basketball were not offered. In the 1950s, after the improvement squad dammed a small stream running through campus, ice hockey was played on the newly formed Proctor Pond. Lyle Farrell became headmaster upon Halsey Gulick's retirement in 1952. A strong, no-nonsense leader, Farrell guided the school through a period of academic improvement, fundraising, and building construction. 
the North addition to Maxwell Savage Hall, including Holland Auditorium, Shirley Hall, and Farrell Fieldhouse were funded by tr trustees with long-standing relationships with Lyle Farrell. The two-track academic curriculum was discontinued. Farrell had been an acquaintance and an admirer of Samuel T. Orton, who pioneered research in the area of reading disabilities, proving that dyslexic people can read through remediation. The evolution of Proctor's tutorial support system into the learning skills department provided the school an academic niche. Proctor became the first college prep school to successfully market its ability to educate dyslexic students. By 1970, at the height of the Vietnam War, a generation gap reflected widespread dissatisfaction and alienation between America's youth and its elders. This division played out on campuses across the nation, and it hit hard at Proctor, where old structures and traditions suddenly seemed out of place. A young teacher out of Colby College named David Fowler emerged as a popular leader within student ranks and was chosen to succeed Lyle Farrell as headmaster in 1971. It is impossible to exaggerate the significance of this choice. Under David Fowler, Proctor changed dramatically. David empowered the faculty to define structures and policies, and a new era began based on democratic and egalitarian principles. Girls were enrolled for the first time in 40 years, and an informal dress code reflected informal faculty-student relationships. At David's right hand was Chris Norris. As a leader, David was a charismatic visionary. Chris balanced this with his belief in accountability, structure, and experiential education. Also close at David's side was his remarkable wife, Alice Stebbins Fowler. Alice provided a soul to Proctor. Indeed, she embodied the school's enduring values, values honed during the school's Unitarian years, values of hope for a better future, of confidence in our abilities to make the world a better place. Her death to cancer in 1991 was a terrific loss for the community. The Hurricane Island Outward Bound program became a model for the advisor system, wilderness orientation, and starting in 1973, mountain classroom. The novel notion that education could take students out west to live with native peoples, study geology, ecology, literature, and ultimately oneself, stimulated language immersion programs in France and Spain. By the late 1970s, Proctor was attracting students for reasons that went far beyond tutorial supports. The school's unique educational programs and hands-on methodologies, coupled with its distinctly human ethos, was attractive to many looking for new and innovative approaches to college preparation. In 1993, Ocean Classroom was added to the school's extraordinary roster of experiential offerings. By the time David Fowler moved on in 1994, his dream had come true. Proctor had an established niche within American boarding schools and was experiencing unprecedented prosperity. If David was an iconoclastic visionary, his successor, Steve Wilkins, was a master educator with a passion for teaching methodology and optimal learning. Steve's unwavering faith in the ability of each Proctor student to exceed all expectations challenged the faculty to take ever greater responsibility for teaching excellence. As the school entered its 150th year, a capital campaign yielded more than $30 million. Dormitories were renovated, the salary pool was expanded, and the arts were elevated throughout the curriculum. By the time Mike Enriquez became head of school in July 2005, Proctor was gaining national attention for the passion of its constituents. A veteran boarding school teacher and administrator Mike brings a commitment to experiential modes of teaching and learning, environmental responsibility, and maintaining Proctor's special place in education. A champion of student residential life, Mike has focused new energy on the hundreds of choices that students make outside of structured time. His vision for Proctor's future is clear and exciting, 
and it protects the essential qualities that distinguish the school. Proctor's history is one of struggle, economy of resources, perseverance, and in recent decades, prosperity. Eliza Butterfield and her circle of friends could never dream that their vision would evolve into the school that we know today with 344 students, 83 faculty, campuses in Spain and France, programs touring the desert southwest and the North Atlantic. It's a distinctly human school and is therefore evolving organically through its people, its students, faculty, alumni, parents, and through you. I hope that you've enjoyed this history and that you will join me in celebrating this remarkable school.